Thanks again for joining us for Film and Theology. I should start things off by saying catchphrase. <laughs> and maybe throw in some adjectives. But I, I want to just spend a little time digesting. I mentioned before we started this evening, I got to do a larger, long-form podcast with my friends at Popcorn Theology. So you guys can always check that out. We do other movies uh, more than once a month. So we just did The Batman and some other things. And it's more for actually sometimes dialogue with some friends and input from some of our listeners is actually kind of fun too. So just a few quick points as we do a little short debrief from Free Guy. I, this movie deals with the idea that there's an original code that's kind of been covered over, buried, borrowed, stolen, etc. And it, it's kind of funny that this movie should deal with that because I, I did think that this movie was... It, I think the word I would use is fresh, but also very familiar. Uh, Solomon in the scriptures would say there's nothing new under the sun, and it's pretty obvious when you watch this movie, if you've seen any movies in the last few decades, that this is not exactly original. This is borrowed code, right? Uh, we, all, we could go all the way back to 1982. Anybody remember a movie, movie called Tron? All right, Trump programs live in a simulated world, not sure if there is a greater world or if users or programmers exist. And then one of them, Jeff Bridges, incarnates. Not as, maybe not as cute as Millie, right, but whatever. And there's a master control trying to abuse the system. Let's, let's jump forward to 1999, maybe we get a little matrix. Characters in a fantasy world and there's an architect keeping them in it for nefarious purposes. Or maybe Wreck-It Ralph where instead of Antoine, we have King Candy, who's sort of pulled the wool over this, the game world that they're in, and has changed the code, and is using it for his own nefarious purposes. Or we could even go more human and go with the Truman Show, which wasn't a video game reality, but a human being kept in this fake reality, and essentially a virtual version of the world, and there's a godlike controller using him for his own purposes. Or maybe the best kiss and cousin would be the Lego movie, where you have Emmett waking up thinking everything is awesome and somebody like Wild Child comes in and turns his world on its head and really there's a whole other reality above that. Like we could go on and on for, for hours, Ready Player One. But there's some recurring themes. I want to peel back the code a little bit from this movie to just help you guys see a pattern that I think at least we can say it turns up again and again in our storytelling, but as this is film and theology, there's a reason I think that it's bigger than that, right? This idea that begins to turn up again and again is the reality you are in is subordinate to some kind of higher reality. That's a story we keep gravitating to and telling over and over again in different contexts. And I think that there's a reason we keep leaning into this idea and not even just in our fiction. Has, has anybody heard of the simulation hypothesis? I know, it's a couple people here, right? Uh, scientists and philosophers have been exploring this actually pretty thoroughly in the last decade or so. Elon Musk actually seems to be a believer in this, the idea, the proposal that, well, let, let me break it down here, regarding the nature of existence, all existence is an artificial simulation. You and I, this whole thing, this is all artificial, we're in a simulation, such, something like a computer simulation. The proposal builds on that idea that Earth could be the end of a long stack of simulations. In fact, in physics, the view of the universe and its ebb and flow has been likened to a quantum computer. And as one BBC interviewer technologist proposed, if, if the idea that we're actually creating these simulated worlds, and then we would think, okay, well, if there are a bunch of populated worlds, somebody could have developed that further and faster than we are, thus, if all of that has been done and now actually whatever original reality there was, multiple simulated worlds have been created by multiple different creators on different planets, the odds statistically that we're actually in the first reality is statistically slim. It, this is actually a theory. Some people actually believe it. And of course, if that's true, one of the quotes I loved from one of the articles I was reading, one guy said, like, whoever is in control of the simulation it would probably be important that as people, as denizens of the simulation, we probably want to know what keeps that thing happy. Right? Because that, that kind of jumps to the second piece, which turns up in the narratives again and again, right? Things going on in the higher reality, 
We're subordinate. Things have gone in a higher reality have major consequences for you and your reality. That, that's, that's what comes into this story. And so I, I want to, well, let's just stop and address the elephant in the room, right? Or the Bible in the room. What, Christians probably already have this a little figured out. These are just variations of grappling with the concept of what Holy Scripture tells us about reality. That there's, there is a higher reality and then there's a virtual reality, or as we might put it in biblical terms, the heavenly realm and the physical or material world spiritual reality and physical reality that there is more and guess what we don't see it and so this movie starts us out with guy right we meet guy quite literally the everyman he's he's the status he's and he accepts the world for the most part he accepts the status quo the world is the way it is and that's all there is to it except something chafes we we learn as we go in the movie something chafes he's actually been seeing glimpses of things and reflections of things and there are dire forces afoot. I, I love the weather reports about all the killing. Are there, and, but there are forces at work in and beyond the world that, that Guy doesn't understand, and in fact, the world's going to come to an end. We have, literally have a judgment day, or a release day, whatever, but upgrade day. And he knows something is right before he even puts the glasses on. He knows something isn't right before he puts the glasses on. Although he has been seeing these reflections, he knows the world is meant to be something else or something more. He, part of him knows there's something beyond this. Christians actually call this, uh, pre-glasses would be what we call general revelation. What can be known about God, Romans said, is, is plain to us because God has shown it to us that his invisible attributes, like reflections on, in creation, actually have been, are, can be clearly perceived in the things that have been made, so we're without excuse. We actually do see. We know somehow, somewhere. But then, of course, our guy puts the glasses down, and now he can see. Now he has new eyes, and he can see things in layers of the world that he hasn't seen before. When this happened in the movie, it reminded me of one of my favorite passages in the entire Old Testament. It's from 2 Kings 6, and this servant of the prophet Elisha is just petrified that these armies have assembled against the people of God and they're totally going to lose. And the second Kings 6, 15 says, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, master, what shall we do? And the prophet says, don't be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's the chariots of fire verse, if you guys ever have heard that phrase. Right Now we can see, oh wow, I thought, I thought we were doomed, but now I, I, God gave me spiritual glasses, and now I see the tanks and armies assembled. Only in this case, the first news that Guy learns is actually kind of scary news. Right? He realizes it's all a lie. He realizes the world is wrong. The world, what the world told him or what, what the vir- virtual world that he existed in told him his identity was, his purpose, why he, why he existed, the creation around him, everything has been distorted somehow. It's not right. Things have been held back. A whole other layer of existence with big consequences has been hung up from him. And it's, this is like the reality of God's Word and the Gospel too. Right, that's the idea, is like, we have general revelation. We can know that there was something wrong with the world. We can know that there's something more. And the Scripture often, we, we can open up Scriptures and we can actually, oh, wow, this says there's a lot more going on. And in fact, it says something else too, right? It, it says something that manifests in this movie and a lot of narratives. Well, the next one, there's a controlling force involved that does not have our best interests at heart. Played by Taika Waititi with glorious aplomb, I thought I should have just come out here first and sat and meditated before I started and then tried to roll back. Right? We realize in this, and he had, he, we see that also we have someone who is in charge, but it's stolen authority. We don't always get that in some of these narratives. And, uh, Millie actually says, or he says, if you've ever met the <clears throat> responsible for this world, you'd agree he's terrible. And Guy says, are we talking about God? You've met God, and he's a, <laughs> right? Now, I suppose in a superficial way, we could think that this movie or this narrative is kind of taking a pot shot at God. And, and 
Some of these narratives grab at those ideas. It could be a fair critique, but what's really cool about Free Guy is that this one doesn't fit. In one sense, he's the god of Free City, but there's actually a very story-driven difference because there's a controlling force involved that does not have the best interests of the people at heart, but he's not the creator. He's not the creator. He seems to be in charge. He has a level of control, but he didn't create the world. He has come in and taken advantage of it, and now it's twisted and perverted. He's in charge, but thankfully, by movie's end, we see only for a time. Like 2 Corinthians 4 actually talks about this God. It says the God of this world, talking about the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to deceive them. Again, he's like King Candy, or he's like the master control program. He's the devil. He's not the creator, but he does seem to have a controlling interest over what we see as reality. And of course, in this movie, who created it? Well, in this, in this narrative, it's Million Keys. And they don't, make a, they, they don't make anything close to a perfect analogy for God. Of course, they're, they're not omnipresent. They're not omniscient. They're not even in control. It seems more evenly matched. Devil and God don't. But here we have this idea that there was a creators that had something entirely other in mind that they created, benevolent, generally kind creators. And we find out something else too. We insert it back up into our list here. The idea that something beautiful has actually been lost. Something was created and lost, and the world guys in is the tragic result of that. We literally have a creation and a fall. And Millie explains what they did and what this is that we see with Free City. Free City is a pale shadow of the original creation. It's another shared narrative point with the greatest story ever told. That there is a higher reality and that our creation actually has fallen. And there's some major consequences and there's someone out with not our best interests at heart. But it's not what the Creator created. It's a fallen city. It's the city of man. Fallen man, virtual man, in this case. And we can see the picture. And yet, even with the glasses, Guy doesn't fully understand, can he? He doesn't really, he doesn't understand just by putting the glasses on what's going on. So he has what we'd call general revelation and even special revelation, but there's one thing lacking. And the movie gives, that to, gives it to us too. Incarnation. One of the creators incarnates into the story, and just seeing her starts to change something in him, right? In fact, changes something in him, he goes and orders a cup of coffee or tries to get a cappuccino, and then we see his change actually starts rippling out and changing others. He's changed. He, she incarnates in the game and he's drawn to her. She's the one who ultimately explains everything to him, tells him the truth of the world and everything around him. In fact, we even find out by the end that Guy was created based created to have a longing for her. She's basically his God-shaped hole. Right? Christians believe that while there's something that makes us rebel against God and even makes us sort of willingly blind to God, there is still a broken and vacuous peace in us that can only be filled or satisfied by knowing Him. And seeing her literally changes his code. He, he becomes something new. And she reveals the truth to him, truth about the world, truth of the judgment day, that, that there is an end pending. Everyone is in danger. That he's not a free guy. I, I love the play on words there. The movie's called Free Guy, which of course has a video game connotation. But the idea is that he's a free guy or the guy is free, but it's actually, it's not a statement, it's a request. Free guy, he needs to be freed. He and these people are basically enslaved. And so we have this, this wonderful, then the narrative continues. The residents of this reality need to have their eyes open and they need to be freed. Because free city is a joke. That's a nice commentary on our reality. No one is free. Nothing is free. That's what the world tries to tell us too. Do whatever you want. This is the way things are. This is how you, you determine who you are. It's like, no, it all has a cost. It's costly. We're not free. And it's all going to come crashing down. And so what does this guy become at various points all through this story? It's, it's kind of funny. At times he's a prophet when he starts wandering through telling everybody it's, it's going to come to a horrible end. And, but he's also an evangelist. It's like Things can be different. Things aren't what you thought they were. You could be more. You don't have to be scared. He tries to evangelize Buddy at the one point. He's just put on the glasses. And he's like, no, I, I don't want to see what you're 
what you're trying to make me see. It may be, may be a bit of a Moses figure, a bit of a Joshua or a Gideon, Guy Gideon, right? The end is coming. We need to turn around. We need to wake up. We need to be free of enslavery to this false master of the world. And ultimately, the, the story doesn't just result in fixing the world they have. Once again, surprise, surprise, the narrative tells us the world ends up needing to be remade and restored, and they have a paradise. Bigger, badder, ratter. No. I, do, do, I hope you could just say, just reading the broad strokes of the narrative beats, this toys with the basic framework of the Christian message. Now, like, off the mark on hitting it exact in a lot of ways. It'd probably kind of just be weird and awkward if it did. But here we have, there's a higher reality. Something, there's been a fall. There's consequences. There's an enemy. We need to be freed and we, we need to wake up. And ultimately, there needs to be a restoration of the world that was broken. And, and of course, who's going to accomplish such a thing? Well, of course, the blue shirt guy ultimately gets to be the one who resets and saves everything. And that's not really the Christian message, because that, that's, that's where we as heroes of our own story like to think that we are the center and not an NPC. And the gospel would tell us, alternately, Jesus paid it all. Jesus is the hero, not us. But there, there's an interesting pause moment when Buddy and Guy hang out in the movie that I think kind of applies to us, too. There's some interesting banter about non-player characters, how we can, should think about them, and, and really what part they have to play. They have that conversation. He's wondering about, does anything really matter? And what if I'm not a major character? What if someone else is the center of the story? What if I am a background character in God's story? What if it is written, and what if there's a judgment day? And what if I'm not the hero? Then what's the point? Does it even matter? Is it even real? Well, I, I think that that's a great question that even Christians have to wrestle with and actually have an answer to. Like, yes, we do. There's a, there's a point, which I'll get to in a minute, but there is that wrestle that we do. Like, what if I'm not the one who saves the day? I and mean, what if most of us are these other characters around Guy in this story, Guy and Millie and Keys? Do we have a part to play? Well, we actually see some of that. And I think we do see this play out in a poignant scene at the very end. If we forget, if we then, if we flip the metaphor, if we forget for a minute that Millie is the creator on one hand, and now just turn around and think of her as a human, which she is in the story, she has that great moment with Guy at the end, where he tells her what she's really longing for. He says, I love you. Now, maybe that's just my programming talking, but guess what? Somebody wrote that program. He says, I'm just a love letter to you. Somewhere out there is the author. That's the role of a Christian in a lot of ways, isn't it? Like, we're supposed to be like blue shirt guy. And yes, we are supposed to be helpful as we move through the world. Maybe not by taking down criminals like that. But ultimately then, when people seem to like us or think that they have a longing for us, we're supposed to say, you know, no, no I'm, I'm just trying to imitate my Savior. I'm just trying to imitate God. There is someone you're longing for, but I'm just trying to glorify Him. You're ultimately only satisfied in, in them. It's the role of being what Scripture calls an image bearer of God. We're supposed to bear his image and point to the author. And of course, for Millie finally figures that out, although it's obvious from like Act 1. But so these are the narrative elements I would say are worth considering and why we keep coming back to them again and again and decade after decade and variation on computer theme or constructed world, or there's a million sci-fi or fantasy references to this same structure that we see again and again and again. And I don't think that's incidental. I think that we have a habit to be myth-makers, and we like myth-making. And that they take a form and a shape because, as C.S. Lewis says, the difference is that Christianity is both myth, but it is also true. It's the epic story, the true story that frames the reality or the sub-reality that we're in as we consider that there is a kingdom and the kingdom of God that actually has a presence and an importance over us. And so I, I hope you guys can learn to see those patterns and continue to enjoy movies in some of those ways because ultimately 
I mean, that's just me, but only in Christ can we be a free guy. And only in Christ do we get an extra life. So that's it for tonight. But uh, before you go, just want you to know, don't have a good day. Have a great day. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for a chance to gather, for a chance for some laughter, and yet a chance for that laughter and that, that fun to also be fun reflection on the fact that, that you've helped some of us know the story we're in. You've, you've put glasses on some of our eyes. You've come into our lives in a way so as to explain uh, that we must concern ourselves with more than this world. And yet we must be concerned for this world and act accordingly. And so we thank you for that story that you bring into our lives. We thank you that silly stories like this can even remind us of it and let us laugh a little easier and then rest a little easier in you while also leaving with little admonitions about remembering the blue shirt we should have and the image we should be reflecting. In your name, amen.